Hey y'all, what it do? It's cause don't give no to what my kid and yes I do. Yeah, and welcome to my city. Y'all should stick around cause your girl need a committee. Come for the attractions and stay for the lifestyle. Peace people, welcome and welcome back to Core City TV. It's your girl Courtney and y'all I have been going through the emotions for like the last hour. Um, my glasses look a little smudged, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Um, I've been going through the emotions for the last hour or so because in my heart, I told myself that I wanted to make this video and I wanted to share this story and this story time. And then also at the same time, I was just like trying to prepare myself mentally for any backlash or any circumstance that this video might create. So I knew that today would be the best time for me to share this video mostly because for one it is the month of april and april is um sexual assault awareness month so i definitely wanted to get this video together and get it shared during the month of april um here on the channel i have started to do my story times on saturdays so this is the last saturday of april so i figured it would be best for me to just go ahead and put myself together and just kind of share this story time this story time is extremely cringe i'm going to let you know in advance um, however, I'm going to push through sharing because I feel like I want to do my part in raising awareness against sexual assault because I feel like my experience, unfortunately, is an experience that is too common in black communities. Now, this might happen in lots of communities, but I'm a black woman. I can only speak to and for what exists in the communities that I'm a part of. And also, again, this is not a general statement. Um, this does not happen to every black female, thank God. But more times than not, listen, it happens too often, okay? And when it happens, we don't have the care, the concern, the rage, the the energy, or even the um, resources um, in some instances to um, change our situation, to protect ourselves, to protect our children. And I'm not making excuses. I'm just speaking um, based off of what I have seen um, that has happened in my life and what I've seen be a repetitive instance that I hear too often when talking to other women of color as far as um, sexual assault instances. So um, clearly I'm going to tell you this story from my perspective and uh, I'm going to try to be as organic as possible, which means I'm not going to edit this video. I'm not going to stop this video. I'm going to try to get it all out. And I'm going to try to get it straight through. When I'm a little bit stressed out, y'all, I start sounding real bad. <laughs> my voice gets deeper. Okay. So I am a woman. It's just that when I'm a little bit, <sighs> my vocals get a little shaky. Okay, so bear with me. Um, I have some watermelon juice drink. This is my first time trying this. I'm not really a fan. Um, but I am thirsty and I don't want to waste my money. It's not bad. It's just really, really sweet and kind of thick. I don't like thick drinks, honestly, unless it's a smoothie and that's the purpose. Um, anyway, let me stick to the script. So if you have watched a few of my story times, then there are certain things that you might be familiar with um, that I can kind of include here now just to kind of get through this story. And I'll leave the links to those story times in the description box down below. Um, one of those story times that I'm going to mention is the one where I celebrated the National Day of Life, uh, Roe versus Wade where um, I shared with the community here in Court City about the fact that I am my mother's daughter out of what she states was a rape scenario. Um, so again, my mom was sexually assaulted and I'm her child out of that sexual assault. My mom did try to have an abortion a few times. She was not successful, clearly. Um, I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, which was the gist of me sharing that story time that day, um, mostly because if it was not for Kentucky state law, your girl might not be here, okay? It was like legal, illegal, legal, illegal. It was a toss up, it was a back and forth. It was a lot going on. The courts couldn't decide where they stood. My mom was in back houses here, there, all different sorts of scenarios to try to change her circumstance. But unfortunately, God said, this child will be born, okay? And here she is, y'all. Um, also, there's a story time that I shared where I talk about hopping out of some vehicles. That story might be true, might not be true. I don't know, je ne sais. But 
Um, it also speaks to the time frame around that time where my mom was really stressed out by my actions and you know I was trying to do good in school but I was so far behind at that point that I was still just a little bit wild and you know trying to play catch up when I could but just doing the most and my mom had decided that she was sending me to live in Louisville Kentucky which is where I was born right um, where we had family at and um, you know I went out there I tried to give it a go it wasn't me um, I had a job like instantly because while I was working in New York City before I had moved there I was working at McDonald's um, and uh, what ended up happening was once I got out there I called up a McDonald's and let them know I was new in town and they hired me the same day so um, I had work I had my own coin and so pretty much my mom sent me to Louisville and she thought I was supposed to stay there um, I wasn't feeling the energy I wasn't feeling the vibes I had got into it with both my aunts um, I have three aunts um, I got into it with two of my aunts and I was just like ready to come home like I wasn't I, home to me was New York I was not trying to stay in Louisville so of course since I had my own job um, I got me a ticket and I got on the Greyhound and I came back to New York you know um, I'll never forget that day um, but a big part of why I also decided to come home to New York is because I was hearing a lot of rumors about who my father was and my mom had never had this conversation with me so I wanted to hear from her I wanted to talk to her and I wanted to understand better and I wanted to know the truth because it just seemed unfathomable and I was just like shocked and at the same time y'all it was almost like history was repeating itself because I had been molested for a few years by my mother's husband and I had not verbally express that to her. I had never said to her, Ma, this is happening to me. So my mother at the time was still married to this man and I wanted to tell her and give her the knowledge about him and this scenario, assuming she had it known, right, um, that I had. So I got me a bus ticket. I came back to New York. And I'll never forget the day, y'all, that I actually, I think I had like a backpack worth of clothes. Like I left all my stuff out there. I wasn't even tripping off of clothes or nothing. And I remember coming back to New York and I remember, um, I know my family must have been looking for me. I didn't have a cell phone or anything at the time. I was still a teenager. I was like 18, barely. And um, I remember, excuse me, I remember, um, I remember because I lived on 137th in Cypress Avenue and I take this is stuff that some of you won't even be able to identify with because you don't live in New York or the Bronx or 137th in Cypress right but I remember it's just things that you remember and right now I was just playing in my head how I got off the train and I was just like well I'm back home this is the New York this is the Bronx I'm back you know and I just remember having this certain sense of belonging like I knew I didn't belong in Louisville and I needed to be in the Bronx and I needed to be with my mom and I needed to talk to her and I needed to share this with her and everything just felt so right but I was so scared y'all I was so scared because the reality is is that I was molested from the ages of like 9 10 and 11 and I was molested by my mother's husband who was very abusive to her he was very abused. He never put his hands on me. He never hit me. He never hit my sister. Actually, he overly loved us, you know, but he also molested me. And I know that some people think, you know, like when you say like, oh, molest, like what it, what it, it all in detail. And when I tell you this man tried to do everything but penetrate me. And the reason being is because I would leave scars on him. I would fight him. I would scratch his body. I would bite him. And these are reasons that I can't say my mom, I can't say that I believe that she did not know because either she thought he was cheating with some women, which was, you know, which is also very possible, or she was just as scared as I was, okay? And so let me just say right there, right now, at this point, I'm not trying to bash my mom by sharing this at all. Um, sexual assault happened. This is my experience with what happened with me being sexually assaulted, but she too. Um, like I said, this man was abusive. He abused my, my family, you know, our home. And um, 
I'm not here for, you know, I'm not trying to bash my mom. So if you are thinking to get crazy in the comment section, think again, because it's just going to be blocked. I'm not going to entertain any sort of negativity. Um, for me, my YouTube channel is definitely going to be about me healing and getting through these things. And I'm sharing this story because I never got to share it before. The only person that I ever shared this with is my mother and my therapist. You see my voice, it goes. It's like the first thing to go when I start to get emotionally wound it up. Um, so, yeah, you know, I'm not here to bash my mom. Mom, if you see this, I love you and I'm sorry, but this is just me sharing my experience and what happened because unfortunately, like I stated too often, um, when things like this happen to black women, um, black females, it is swept under the rug. There is no justice sought after. There's no, um, healing that happens. There's no communication and there's just a sweep it under the rug. What happens in my household stays in my household. Forget it ever happened and pay it no mind. Okay. Move on. Live your best life. That's kind of how we as black women, black Black girls, black nieces, black aunts, black grandmothers, black females, black women have to kind of deal with these scenarios when they happen because say, we can't all afford therapy, you know? And if you don't go to church, which if you black, Jesus is your therapy, you know? So that's it and that's all, period. But, um, okay, let me get back on topic. Oh my gosh. So with that being said, this is not to bash my mom. Anyway, I made it back to the Bronx, y'all. I felt like I belonged and I knew that I had the heaviest task on me at hand, which was to go talk to my mom. And in my head on the bus ride, I kept saying, I can't wait. I have to talk to her immediately. Plus I have these questions about who my father is that I've been hearing rumors about. I don't know what's going on. Why would it, she tell me this? Like maybe it's because I didn't tell her and she knew. Like it was just so many things going on in my teenage brain at the time y'all um but also let me just back back up because i did say that this happened i was molested between the ages of 9 10 and 11 this man was in a relationship with my mom he was very big a very big guy he was abusive i was really scared of him um at first initially i had mad love for him because he was um I thought he was smart. I thought he he was like a knowledgeable person and he had he was a Muslim man or so a pretentious Muslim um, person. And so he had all of these Islamic stories to share and I was intrigued by them because I was brought up as a Christian. I went to church. I didn't, you know, I believed in Jesus Christ. I didn't know that there were other gods or other religions or anything like that. So I was intrigued and maybe that was, I don't know, like, Tyson. Anyway, um, so this happened for years and it happened this way for years because I was fearful to say anything because again, you know, he never hit me, but he hit my mom and he had kids and it used to be honestly where when his kids came over, I would beat them up. You know, like if he's going to hurt my family, then I'm going to hurt his. And I know that that's not, um, listen, I find I tooth for tooth that I remember from elementary school. And that is what I was able to put in play in my household. That's what I knew. Um, but anyway, y'all, I was home. I lived on the 15th floor and two blocks away from the subway. And I walked around the corner and I saw some of my friends. And they was like, Courtney, oh my gosh, what you doing here? We thought you moved. And I'm like, yeah, I was there, but I wasn't there, y'all. Like, I saw my friends, and I wanted to enjoy seeing them, and I was so happy to see them, but I knew that I had to go talk to my mom, and that was the only thing that was on my mind, to be honest. So, I remember getting in that. I remember all of this, y'all, like it was yesterday. I remember getting in the elevator. I remember, ding, ding. Like, I remember slowly crawling, the elevator slowly crawling up 15 floors. Like, it was the longest elevator ride I ever had in my life. I think I walked down the hall as slow as it took the elevator to go up those flights like i was so scared i was so so scared and i knocked on the door and i didn't get an answer and i knocked i think probably by the third round of knocks she came but i could kind of hear somebody like she might have been on the phone but i wasn't sure she came, she opened the door, she looked, and she smiled, but it was like a snarky, like a, I don't know, like, I'll never forget her face, but I, I don't know if I can make the expression, y'all. I look just like my mom, too, y'all. It's crazy. But, um, she kind of looked like, 
Like, I knew you was getting ready to come back home. Or I knew this was you knocking at the door, but why are you here? You know, like, one of those scenarios. And she opened the door, and I was like, Ma, I couldn't stay out there. You already know, da 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 And so I came in, and she didn't hug me. She didn't kiss me. She didn't act like she missed me. She went right back to her phone call. Her eyes, her look in her face showed me that she did miss me. My mom's love language was has never been affection. None of her love language has never been affection. Um, she went in her room. She was sitting on her phone, sitting on her bed on the phone. And if y'all remember the other story time where I talked about sneaking my ex-boyfriend out of the crib, I give you all like a visual of how the apartment looked. And so... At the end of the hall was the bathroom, and then it was a bedroom here, and then a bedroom there, and then moving forward was the living room and the kitchen. So my bedroom was right in front of the bathroom, which was like right about here, and then my mom's bedroom was right here. So I came out of the bedroom, you know, that was my bedroom, and I was just like pacing back and forth, walking from the kitchen back to the bathroom, from the kitchen back to the bathroom. And um, I guess after a few times, she was like, Courtney, what? What? What do you want? Like, what do you, why are you pacing? And I didn't even realize I was pacing, y'all, but I just stopped and I was so nervous and I was so scared. And I was like, Ma, Ronnie molested me. And I'm saying his name. I'm saying his name because to this day, to this day, he is a registered sex offender. Okay? Yes, to this day. And she said, what? And I said, Ronnie molested me. And so she said, what you mean? What is what, what did he do to you? And I told her that he got on top of me, that he held me down, that I fought him, that I bit him, that I scratched him, that he ripped my clothes, that he broke my clothes, that he wouldn't let me move, that sometimes I couldn't breathe. I told her all the graphics. I told her all the details. She started crying. She still didn't hug me. She still didn't touch me. She still didn't kiss me. She didn't say sorry. She looked at me. And at that moment, she told me who my father was. And as if I wasn't already dealing with the battle and the struggle of sharing with her the truth that I just shared with her, now I had this information that I had heard throughout the summer being confirmed. And I wanted that information, but I just wasn't ready for the impact. It just hit me like, boom. And I just, ooh, ashy. Wow, my hands, they're not even ashy. They just look like it. It just hit me. It just hit me very hard, y'all. And I just really wasn't ready. And I was just really sad. And I was just like, what? Are you sure? And she was like, of course I'm sure. I was, you know, like she explained herself or, you know, shared with me what she wanted to share with me. And um, I was just, I was just stuck. And I just sat there on her bed and she got up. I never forget. She walked out her room. She took her phone. And she got on the phone because, you know, back then we had a phone that sat at the front of the house. But you could literally walk from room to room to room with that phone. It had the longest cord ever. And so she called her sister. And she was just talking to her sister, telling her sister everything that happened to me. And I was so sad, y'all, that I ran out the apartment. I left. And I went downstairs. And I called my aunt that I knew she was on the phone with, who I was also staying with while over the summer and I was like to my mom I'm like hey how are you and she was like hey like very blank sounding and I was like did my mom tell you what I just told her and so she was like yeah and I said I don't know what to do what should I do and so she was like I don't know Courtney why didn't you why are you just now telling her this and I was like well I didn't I don't know why I just I don't know you know, in my mind, as a teenager then, I wasn't thinking to tell her I was scared. He was beating her. He was going to hurt her. He was, like, when he wasn't hurting, like, if, if I wouldn't have had cooperated, it would have been worse. All right? So, you know, it's just like, okay, so this is a two-part story. Now, the reason he was not there and the reason that I wasn't afraid to come back home and the reason that I knew I needed to come home and talk to my mom asexually was because he was in jail. Like I said, y'all, he's a registered sex offender to this day. So it's a two-part story. That is 
the meat and potatoes. You got the story now. That's that's the story time. But there is a part of this story time that is, from my perspective, y'all can hear the dogs, my neighbors, um, they letting their dogs out in the yard. Um, how do I start this story time? So, pretty much, let me share with y'all why he was no longer in our household. And from my perspective, this is the first time that I ever manifested a thing in my entire life. However, some people will say that it wasn't necessarily me manifesting a damn thing because realistically, life happened, okay? But I will never forget y'all. And if you want to doubt me, I'm, his name is Ronnie Green, okay? That is his full government name. He is a registered sex offender here in the Bronx, okay? And the thing about him and the thing about this scenario is... Like I said, this this man, you know, like, he had a very... We lived in the projects. He had a very big family in the projects. It was a lot of them. And you really didn't cross them or bother them or whatever, you know? So in so many ways, I feel like my mom sought after being in a relationship with this type of person for protection. We was new to the Bronx. We was new to New York. We was new to the Bronx. Like, you know, um, we had lived in Brooklyn prior, but... You know, this was a new energy, a new um, atmosphere and everything for her. So I felt like she started dating somebody that she felt could give her protection. But I don't think that she ever anticipated or intended or thought that he would violate and be the person that she needed protection from, you know. And so one thing just led to another and they became enthralled in this relationship. And um, I'll never forget. Um, so he had a big family there. And y'all... I don't even remember what year this was, but it was my 11th birthday, my 11th birthday, y'all. And this is the first time that I ever manifested anything in my life, okay? Keep in mind, I said I was being molested from 9, 10, and here we are at 11 years old. And I, I'm I'm so tired. I'm so fed up. I knew that I wasn't going to be able to fight him for but so much longer. I didn't feel like nobody was there to protect me. And... I didn't know what else to do. So, y'all, I prayed religiously. I prayed like it was going out of style. My middle name was prayer. I prayed every day. And I remember getting into an argument with God, y'all. I used to get into arguments with God. And I got into an argument with God. And I was like, you know, like, I've been praying to you for a very long time about this scenario. Like, why aren't you taking this man out of my life? And it was my 11th birthday. And I remember, like, I kept telling myself that for my birthday wish, I was going to pray hard, hard, and blow out every candle on my cake with one blow. Like, I was going to pray this man out of my life like nobody's business. Do you understand? I hope y'all understand. Because this is the first thing that I ever manifested. And it's an unfortunate situation though, but this is what happened. So I didn't get the justice that I probably should have been molested, but someone did get justice. So in most instances where people, women of color, are often overlooked and I don't want to just say women because boys are molested too by your boyfriends your uncles your brothers your this and your that whatever this happens to it does not matter it does not matter the sex this happens okay some men are sick some men are sick some men are pedophiles this is what they're into this is what they do this is what they like this is why it's up to you to protect your children your family your loved ones okay but anyway it was my 11th birthday and like I said he had a very big family and he had a sister who had like, at that time, I think she had like seven, eight kids. And I remember my mom had made my cake. I always loved when she baked my cake. And she had baked me a cake. And I'm pretty sure it was chocolate because I always love chocolate cake. And um, she had asked him to go to the store to get ice cream. And I'm pretty sure my mom does not even know that I remember this. But this is, I remember this because I manifested this. This this, I had been praying this for weeks leading to my birthday. I got into an argument, y'all, a full-blown... I wasn't talking to God no more. I was mad at him. Like, if God wasn't finna fix this, me and him was not about to be cool no more. Like, he understood. He knew that. Like, it was... We had this conversation already. Like, 
God, I'm writing you off. If you don't take care of this, like, I shouldn't have to deal with this. Like, this man is hurting me. He's hurting my mom. God forbid he hurt my little sister. Like, why, why are you doing this to us? Like, God, you need to do something. So that's where I was at. I was at my wit's end. And, um, whew, again, y'all, birthday, 11 years old. Um, this is public information, too, as far as his arrest is concerned, because he's a registered sex offender. So you can do the math and figure out my age and everything if you were wanting to be that clever. But, um, like I said, his he had a sister who had a bunch of kids, and my mom has sent him to go get ice cream, or he decided to go get ice cream. I don't know. He was on his way to go get ice cream. And that was the story they told to me. But I believe... And I think it was later stated, but not by my mom, because she hid this truth from me for a very long time. But I, be I remember it being spoken about in the community um, surrounding this scenario. So because he had a sister that had a bunch of kids and he was stepped out to go get the ice cream, he was supposed to also go get the kids and bring them back to sing happy birthday to me. Well... He didn't come back home or come back to our home until well after midnight that night. And I remember because eventually we sung happy birthday. I was happy. I didn't care. I didn't want him there. Like, Ma, come on. We could do it without him. We don't need him here. Let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to me. It's my birthday. I don't want to wait for him. Let's sing. Let's go. We sung happy birthday. We had a grand old time. Ate good. I'm pretty sure your girl had meatloaf, cabbage, and mashed potatoes. That was like one of my big, big girl right here. One of my favorite meals for my mama to cook for me. Um, but... We had finished our evening. The night was done. And I remember it was well after midnight that he came to this door. And I remember being so devastated and being so sad. Like, God, you were supposed to keep him going. Like, you were supposed to make sure that he never came back. That's it. I'm not talking to you guys. Like, seriously, honestly, y'all. And um, what ended up happening was about a week later, he was gone. And my mom tried to tell me that he got arrested for assaulting a police officer in the train station. Like, he punched the cop. He's going to be going to jail for a very long time. But the streets was talking. And the streets were saying little different things. Now, this is back when I was a kid. I'm, I'm going back and forth. This is not when I was 18. That part of the story finished. I shared with my mom what happened to me. She told me who my father was. I was out of her house, out of her apartment within a matter of months. We was, we was oil and water. It, I couldn't stay there anymore. But right now, I am rewinding back to when I was 10, turning 11 years old. And my mom told me that he punched a police officer in the face and he was going to jail. And I was like perplexed, but I was happy. God heard me. I manifested it. I prayed to God for him to go away, for him to go to jail, and he's not here no more. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. I was so happy, y'all. I was the happiest kid. Me and God been like this ever since. Like, I am so full. If God say, don't go that way, don't turn that corner, move around, go back, say no, pick up the phone, I listen. I'm on it. I'm on it. I'm on it, on it, like white on rice. Like, I don't play about God and God don't play about me. And that was when he let me know that he had my back and that he heard me praying. And y'all, from my birthday night, he came in late that night. Within a week or two, he was gone. And I ain't never, I never saw that man again in my life until one day in my adulthood about, how many years ago was that? That was probably like 2011, 2000. It was after 2011. It was like 2014, 13 or 14. I ran into him because I had a, a tutoring job. I was tutoring and um, I had my tootie with me. And I remember just walking on Southern Boulevard and I ran right into him. And he looked at me like he was so happy to see me. And I was like, you better not. You mother. And I just kind of remember that I had this kid with me and kept it moving. But I was ready to curse him out and fight him and everything. Like, how dare you, bro? Like, don't act like we cool. Don't act like you know me. You ruined my mom. You, you hurt us, bro. And y'all, even with my hip condition, I feel like having that 250-pound person on top of my body has a lot to do with why I have these pins in my hips as well. But that's another story for another day. Where I'm at right now with it is I was happy this man was no longer a part of my life. However, I had not told my mom. 
You get where I'm going? I had not told my mom because he was removed. So whether she knew based off of paying attention and knowing your kids or whatever or not known, I don't know. What I do know is that he went to jail and she got married to him and it was riding and she was going to see him. And I just felt terrible, like, oh my God, let her marry him. I don't know if she really married him though, because I think it was something she had to do with paperwork and she wasn't sure she wanted to do it. Anyway, long story short, I felt really bad. Um, he had been sentenced to eight to, to nine, like, Ten, like 10 years or something like that and it was about the time for where he was about to actually come home all right so that was a big part of why I came home too because I felt like I needed to let my mom hear it out of my mouth I need to say to her what her husband did excuse me um before he was actually put back in her life okay I needed to make her fully aware of what happened and so I did but y'all over the course of time, while my mom was going to visit him, while he was up north and stuff, um, I was a nosy kid. So I found documents about why he was locked up. And y'all, that man got locked up. That male, that male, because he's not a man. That male got locked up because on the night of my birthday, when he was supposed to go get ice cream and go get them kids, and bring them back to my crib to sing happy birthday to me, he raped the babysitter, a 15-year-old girl. He raped her. I'll never forget because people, like his family, and it was like conversations being said, and like I said, the community started talking, and they was all calling her a liar and saying she was fast, and, and she, she was like fresh or whatever, but I knew, I knew, I knew that it was true and that it happened. And then once they read the court documents and the paperwork, his semen was found there. So whether she was being fast or not, he was still in the wrong. So yeah, he's a registered sex offender. And um, let me tell y'all what I did, y'all. So I remember one day, um, this was after I had moved out of my mother's place or whatever. Um, he used to call the crib still, he used to call the house. But my mom, my mom always worked overnight. So I was at the crib and I, did, I wasn't living there at the time. So it wasn't expected for me to be there. He had no clue that I was going to be there. But he was calling, I guess, as he normally would at night. Or maybe my mom could have mentioned that I was going to be there. I don't know. But what I do know is that I answered the phone and they said, you have a collect call from. And in my heart, I wanted to hang up. But I was like, nah, I'm about to curse this fool out. So I was like, what's because you still calling my mom for? Like, what's your problem? Like, you was a thirsty, dirty funk. Like, I was just reading him for filth. And I was like, and you know what? If you love my mom, yo, if you love her, if you if you have respect for her, if you respect my family, if you even give a sh about any of us, walk away. Walk away. She will be fine. She is fine. She is the bomb. She's dope. She don't need you. We good. One yourself. Banged it on him. He called back. Picked up. Collect call. I'm like, what are you still calling for? You not get the picture? Do you not get the message? She used to call me fat. So he was like, fat, fat. Listen, listen, like trying to talk, talk to me and get me to understand where he was coming from. I was like, you are a piece of shit ass Negro. Stop calling here. Go be with your boyfriend or whatever the F -F you got going on, bro. Like, go. And um, I was so mad. I was so mad. Like, my sister had woke up. She was like, what happened? Who you was talking to? I was like, nothing, nobody. Like... I was just so destroyed at that time that the next morning, I think my sister had left to go to school or wherever she went. My mom, because he was Muslim, he had like a bunch of really nice fancy suits inside the closet. My mom had a closet full of his suits, like lined up. Like if the closet was this big, from there to there was all his suits. And she had like a wardrobe, you know, for her clothes and other stuff, dresses, drawers, whatever. But in the closet was all of his shit. I was so angry by that call from the night before, and I knew my mom wasn't going to be home that morning um, at the regular time that she normally would, and I was up and I was bored. I took a razor blade, and I went and opened up every suit, y'all, like every slash, slash. I cut everything, cut, slash, slash. slash. I felt so rejuvenated, like on some real way to a tail, like, <sighs> like the anger, the rage, everything. Every time I slashed a piece of clothing, like the anger, the fear, the bravery that I needed was being restored. Like I was so 
relieved, y'all. Like, super freaking relieved. And then I was scared because after I had ripped up everything, I'm looking like, oh my God, my mom is going to be so mad. Like, she's not one to, you know, she she would have just rather give him his stuff and that just been that. But me personally, at this point, I don't already told you because now I'm fast forward. Now this is when, you know, I done moved out of her house. So clearly I done already had a conversation with her and let her know that, you know, this is what happened. And the fact that she was still going to see him and still dealing with him, it really broke my heart. But the fact that he was in jail, it, it was like, all right, whatever. If you let my mom tell the story and, you know, in her, in, in her defense or whatever, um, she did, she has mentioned because recently, well, not recently, but I had mentioned to her, like, it really broke my heart that she was still communicating with him. And she was like, oh, please, wasn't nobody communicating with him. I was only dealing with him for the money because he had, like, a big lawsuit or some, something going on. And the fact that he was locked up and she was his wife and, you know, she had access. I don't know. A whole bunch of stuff, reasons that she tried to make me feel like it was a method to her madness for why she was still going to see him locked up or whatever but you know he he was so cool with her that he thought that once he came home he surely was bold enough to knock on her door and go retrieve his clothes and that's when they both found out Courtney scissor hands heads on the job <laughs> there was no clothes to retrieve okay so I guess that was my justice and um this is my justice um, continuing to share this scenario and I hope that you know it's not it's never gonna be easy I remember there was this lady um, who I used to go to church with and she told me that she had a son I knew her son and that her son you know she was in a relationship with this guy and that her son and her had such a sort of relationship because the man that she was in a relationship with started molesting her son and she said that in the middle of the night when he came in one night, pissy drunk, and she knew that he was out like a lamp, she literally packed up her stuff, her son's stuff, and hit the road jack and never looked back. She didn't know where she was going, what she was doing. She braved the streets and took on whatever was coming her way with her kid and soul, and, you know, was happy that she did that. And I respect and I applaud that because, you know, in too many instances, I don't think it's so much that our mothers, women, you know, persons that are responsible for protecting us don't believe us. It's just the matter that they don't want to believe. It. They don't want to believe that they've been betrayed. They don't want to believe that, you know, the person that they love or care for, their brother, their uncle, their father, whatever, has this sick genetic in them that is going to make them want to lay with them and then also touch on their children, you know? And I think that, you know, as women, um, I don't have children, but I feel like, you know, you notice when your kids, I was, I was, I wasn't never like the brightest, smartest kid in school, but I didn't really start having problems in school until that started happening to me. I hated my life. And then with the surgery and everything, like really a big way that he was able to get to me, honestly, was because he was empathetic towards me. He showed me compassion where my mom was never a compassion. She was never an affectionate woman. She was, I got beat. I got beat in the streets. I got beat by my mom. Like I was, I always got my ass beat. You know what I'm saying? So for me, he always, he kind of protected me and he used that he used knowing that I relied on him to get closer to me, to hurt my family. So pay attention to your children, pay attention to your family, pay attention to the needs and the things that's going on and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to get help. Um, I know that in New York City, we have um, services that are provided by um, organizations like Safe Horizon that will get you the assistance that you need. If you find yourself in a domestic violence case, I am definitely gonna make sure to leave a link in the description box to those sorts of um, places that I can find here in New York because you know I have worked um, with the Department of Homeless Services and, and, and there are a lot of women who I met 
that came in and out of the system based off of not only traumatic sexual experiences that happened to them, but also to their parents that they told me about. And then they were seeing the things happen to their children as well. And like, how do you break those cycles, especially if nobody's communicating, especially if like, you know, majority of black parents or black homes, we have that mentality of what goes on in my household stays in my household. If you're going to tell somebody something, you better go tell it to Jesus and that's it and that's all. But we have to get out of that frame of mind, especially if we want to get therapy, especially if we want to be able to help each other and one another. You know, I come from a family where my mother has three sisters and then her mother has three sisters. There are no men in our family for real. So with all these women, there should not be a scenario where my my mother is telling me that my father raped her and that that person is a family member or that you know um I didn't have anybody to go to at 11 years old or I, I felt scared to tell my mom and don't get me wrong my mom asked me those questions she said Courtney is anybody ever touching you but I also feel like a lot of times parents do that because once you say no, you're a child, you're scared. You understand? Um, if you see, if a man is hurting you and he's putting his hands on your mama and your mama is asking you something like, is this happening to you? You would tell me, right? Like, come on, I'm a kid. That's a lot of weight. That's a lot of pressure. Like, yeah, I will tell you. I want to be able to tell you, but I'm scared you might get stuck up tonight. You feel me? So at the same time, it's like, be realistic with what with the pressures that you're applying to your children. Be realistic with the truth that you're expecting from your children and just pay attention, pay attention. You know damn well if, if your 10 year old starts to have hygiene um, concerns or as her body is developing or changing or whatever, you're fully aware. You buy the, the items that she would need. So these are things that you have to pay attention to as a parent and I get it, we have jobs, we have school, we have life, we have so many things that's going on but Aside from all of those things, you have your family, and that's the most important thing. Um, those are your gifts from God, and you have to be able to protect, and you have to be able to prevent that cycle from re reoccurring and happening again and again and again by creating actual ways to communicate about these things happening in our households and in our lives. So anyway, on that note, this is already a 40 minute video, but yes, I did manifest that creep to go to jail, but unfortunately he had hurt another young lady. However, in that instance, she did seek justice and he did go to jail. I don't know if she would feel like that was the right amount of justice, but he did do, I think like from eight to 10 years, I don't remember the exacts or whatever, but he was gone for a very long time. It was my 11th birthday, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, and he was gone, okay? Um, have a great Saturday. Have a wonderful weekend. We do, we do story times here at Court City TV on Saturday. So um, check on your strong friends. Check on the people who you don't necessarily generally tend to want to check on. I'm the strong friend. Check on me. Check on me. No, I'm kidding, y'all. I have God. Me and God have been in an everlasting relationship since since 10, since 11. He has been everything that I've needed. And honestly, like a lot of people are always like, Courtney, why are you single? You're so beautiful. You're so this. You're so that. You're confident. You're strong. You're that. A big part of why I'm single is one, I, I don't, I date females, but I'm not a lesbian. And I love men, but not y'all. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> not just no basic. Not no, you know what I'm saying? Regular, degular, schmegular. I'm not a regular, degular, schmegular kind of girl. And I don't want a guy who is just, who thinks that he's extraordinary, but realistically, he's doing basic Negro shit either. I don't need that in my life either. Um, if you go back, I'm going to put a link in the description box. I, um, I G make Sylvia Striplin song. Sylvia Striplin is an artist from the 80s. Uh, she's actually, she actually, I think she lived in Harlem, the Bronx, but, um, she created this song, Give Me Your Love in 81. I was born in 81, so I g mixed that song, and there's a verse in that song where I say, it take a guy for me to settle down over G like James Brown hitting me with the get down, yeah, and that's what she need, okay? A whole different sort of individual, absolutely. With that being said, y'all, you know the vibes. I'm so happy that I didn't have a downpour honestly 
um, that just speaks to the healing. That just goes to show that the more we do communicate about these things, we do get stronger. You do strengthen yourself um, by just taking your power back. And, you know, not speaking on it makes it, I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor, okay? And being able to speak on it reminds me that I'm a survivor and that I'm not a victim. So that's why we have to get out of the mentality of what happens in my household stays in my household and neglecting our daughters. Love your daughters. If you got a daughter, grab her up, hug her up, tell her that she mean the world to you and tell her that if anybody ever, you know what I'm saying? Let her know, let her know. And that's it, and that's on, that's on, period, y'all. Y'all know the vibes, like, comment, share, and subscribe. Then turn on that button to get notified. Your girl looking for her tribe. I need a thousand neighbors just to get by. So like, comment, share, and subscribe. Then turn on that button to get notified.